Hello, and welcome to, to the last edition of Supplier Edge for the year. I am super excited today. We're going to be talking about how business owners can really make the most of working with Fortune 500 companies and how to get into their supply chains and into their supplier programs. Uh, in particular, we have a, a guest here today, Julia Hubble, who um, I've had a, a wonderful conversation with earlier, and she really was, uh, came across as someone who's going to really get you in and understand how do you, how do you, you know, once you meet up with these people, how do you really leverage the, that and, uh, and, and drive your business going forward from there? So uh, for everybody listening in, please feel free to ask questions anytime using the chat. There's a little chat down at the, the left, and you can ask your questions. We will do a Q&A afterwards where we can follow up and make sure that we get your questions answered. We also have a LinkedIn community that we've been growing and, and love to see the activity over there. So you can always uh, join us on LinkedIn. We'll make sure to post a link to that group uh, at some point in the chat. Please consider joining us there as well. So with that said, I'm going to do a brief intro and then uh, pass the presentation off to Julia. Um, my name is Dustin Luther. I'm here with Dun & Bradstreet Credibility Corp. We are the ones who are helping put together this Supplier Edge initiative, and really it's just about helping business owners understand how they can grow and within supplier programs, whether it be manufacturing or, so, or retail or within supplier diversity programs or, or other similar programs that uh, so many companies offer. And with that in mind, uh, Julia Hubble here, I want to welcome you and let you take over and run the presentation for us. So Julia, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so very much. And for everybody here who doesn't know me, uh, I'm a supplier diversity professional, but I'm also a supplier. I see we have mostly women online here. And so let me just kind of give you the lay of the land very quickly. I'm a certified professional in supplier diversity, but like probably everybody online, I'm also a supplier. I'm a women-owned business. I'm, a, uh, I'm also a veteran. And so uh, like everybody here, I have to walk the halls, scale the walls, and make the calls like everybody else does. But I'm also come from corporate. So I've got one foot on the corporate side and one foot on the supply side. And I'm going to be talking really fast for about 20 minutes. It's going to be like wrapping your lips around a fire hose. So guys, don't take notes because this program is going to be up on the web page really pay attention to the questions that come up as you're listening and be ready to post those because I'm going to go for about 20 minutes, write down your questions. I'm going to do my best to answer them. So think about what happens when you've spent your money and your time and your effort going to a conference. Whether you go to the, the WBDC, NMSDC, WeBank, or any of the major conferences, you've gone, you've met people, you're all excited. Now you've got the conference information, you've met people, you've met folks from the Fortune 500, first-year folks, all that stuff. You've invested your time, your blood, your sweat, your tears. Now what? Already, you're, you've come home, and you're ready, you're ready to come home, you're back at the office. And so what happens you're, you've got things to do. You've been away for a while. The problem is the things to do. You're overwhelmed a little bit because you've got clients to take care of now. And the problem is these are the clients that are taking care of you, keeping you where you are in business. You're feeling a little bit overwhelmed. And the big problem is that the statistic that we have to worry about is that 90 plus percent of all the leads that we pick up at trade shows are never followed up. That is just a standing statistic for most of us who go to these conferences. It sounds crazy. We put all of this money and all of this effort into going to these conferences, but yet so many of us go back to our offices and get so caught up into the day-to-day -day doing this that we don't follow up on these hot leads. That's what typically happens. But there's another side to this, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But for the first things first, the most important thing you need to do is what everybody else isn't doing, and that is to go to a stationary store, get really good stationary, and write a personal thank you note. And the reason why is because it's what nobody else does anymore. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to do a little bit of bragging here because I have done business with 21 of the Fortune 100. I'm a one-woman business, and the reason that I've done that is because I try to do what nobody else does. 
it is really easy to send an email. It's really easy to send a tweet. That's why you get forgotten. When I walk into the office of somebody that I've sent a thank you note to, that note is usually either on their desk or it's on their cubicle wall. It's easy to be remembered if you do something personal and thoughtful. So this is really old-fashioned. If you say, well, my handwriting isn't any good, it doesn't matter. The point is you are willing to take the time to write something thoughtful in your own handwriting. So do what nobody does anymore. Get good stationery. Write a personal note. The other downside of when we go to a conference is that we get so excited about these opportunities that we leave the folks that got us where we are today behind. We start chasing that Fortune 500 so hard that the folks that love us and got us where we are today start looking around for another provider. So we have to be really careful to balance our time, balance our portfolio, and I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. Now, the one thing that we have to be really careful about is when we start coming, coming around and saying, well, you know, the guy sounded really interested. Where's my phone call? We had a really good chat with the guy at the booth or the woman at the booth, and we think, well, how come they aren't calling me? Well, the number one formula for those of us who want to do business with the Fortune 500 is that there has to be a fit, there has to be a need, and there has to be capacity. And if there isn't any any aspect of that three-part formula, we are not going to be doing business with them. And that's why it could take years. Now, it's possible we could have a contract in nine months, and it also could be possible it's going to take 12 years to get in the door. And this is the reality of doing business with a multi-billion dollar firm. And for most of us, especially when we start, start thinking about what it takes to do business with these multi-billion dollar companies, we're looking at a very, very long timeline. timeline. So we have to kind of sit back and look strategically at what it's going to take. And for most of us, it's it's going to take a long time and working in at those lower tier levels and getting settled in for the long run and keep the folks that got us here today very, very happy and balancing our time. And the truth is, those folks aren't going to be calling us. We're going to be calling them. The next thing is what did we really hear at the booth? And this is one of those really important lessons. So the first bullet point is so somebody says, hey, there may be some interest at some point. Or somebody says, it sounds intriguing. Folks, this is not contract language. And people have gone broke when they hear this and they suddenly sell everything, they put lots of money into potential business because they've heard this language and they hear contract. You do not have a contract until somebody has signed on the dotted line and you've got money down. If you have heard this, this is wishy-washy language, and it is incumbent upon us as good salespeople to nail them down right now and say, what do you mean by that? Can you be more specific? Exactly what do you mean by interest? Are we talking about now? Are we talking about six months from now? It is up to us to start nailing down that person and say, what do you mean by that? Exactly be specific because that protects us from making a bad decision putting money into our business when it's all airy-fairy and somebody's just being nice to us, being polite to us, and what they're talking about is 10 years down the pike and we're thinking about something that's 10 months down the pike. Real interest is actionable. When somebody says, we need that in the next 12 months and I need to talk to you in the next month, that's actionable. That's when you can talk about real dates, real times, real money. That's when we need to be able to pin it down. Have they got the money? Have they got a date? And is it real? So we need to be thinking about settling in for the long haul and getting ready for a good long time. So here's our competition. That's everybody that wants in the door. And we want to say, well, I'm the one in the red hat. A lot of red hats out there. Well, I'm the one in the blue hat. Lots of blue hats out there. So our challenge is how do we make ourselves differentiated by everybody, from everybody else who does what we do? And that's one of the fundamental challenges that we've got as suppliers. How do I differentiate myself from everybody else? And there are tens of 
thousands of us out there all competing for a spot in that supply chain. And it's extremely competitive. There are so many of us. And the supplier diversity professional's first responsibility is to fill the open RFPs. And they are looking for people who are already in the supply chain to do it because we always will go to who is already there rather than take a chance on somebody new. And that's just the reality. We would do the same thing. So we have to be so convincing that what we do and what we can provide is so good that they'll say, you know something, I'm willing to take a chance on you. That's why we have to have a good value proposition. So how do we stand out? Number one, we have to do at least 80 hours of solid research on that company, and I'm talking about just one company. And if you're listening to this saying, man, I don't have time to do that, then we don't have time to work with the Fortune 500. That's why I'm saying we've got to really balance that portfolio and say, you know, I've got to take care of the folks that are paying my bills right now, net 30, net 60, before I start chasing the Fortune 500. I guarantee you every supplier that is already in that Fortune 500 supply chain has already done 80 to 100 to 180 hours of research on the website, the industry rags, researching and glad handling and networking their way to get into that supply chain already. That's what it takes. And a real challenge here is undercover boss type research. If you haven't watched this program, it is a great way to find out how to do it. You know why? Because the boss goes in there and he gets his hands dirty and he gets embarrassed and he gets really humbled by what's going on at the boots on the ground level. So if you think about what it takes to really understand what makes a company run, let's say you want to go sell some widget to Walmart. You walk the stores, you walk the halls, you look at what's on the shelves, you find out who your competitors are. There's a gal up in Halifax that does this. She's got a $600,000 company. I mean, that's a net fart in a hurricane. I mean, you realize that she's just this little bitty company up in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She sells to Walmart. And the reason she does that is because she puts in 80 to 100 hours worth of research before she ever talks to a buyer. And she only sells them one thing out of her whole life. But what happens is she knows exactly what she can sell them, she knows what China sells them, and she knows what 3M sells them. And when she talks to the buyer, the buyer cannot knock her down. That's really good savvy. And when she goes back to everybody else that she sells to in Canada, she uses that great big sword, that big Thor's hammer that she's got called Walmart to get her in the door of everybody else that she sells to, and that is really good marketing. That's undercover boss research. Research. The other thing is that our primary job, once we come back from a conference, is to strengthen our relationship with all of the Net30, Net60 clients. We un ensure their undying loyalty and manage our time chasing the F500 client base. 80-20, 85-15, and beware mission creep because what happens, you start finding that maybe somebody's a little bit interested in you, and that is so seductive. Maybe, you know, maybe Dun & Bradstreet and the Credibility Corp or somebody out there starts showing a little bit of interest. It's like, wow, your ego gets excited, and you start chasing that down, and you know, somebody back home starts going, well, what happened? You know, Linda's not interested in me anymore. And they start looking around for somebody else when that good customer service starts to kind of droop a little bit. And we can't afford to let that happen because those people are bread and butter and you can't afford to let those people go away. The other thing is when we start thinking about making our follow-up calls, we have to have a value proposition that is so sharp that when we get on the phone with people, somebody says, well, what do you do? You cannot wander and waffle and whistle and take too much time to explain. It's got to be seven seconds long and so sharp, and you've got to have one for every line of business. Short, sticky, sweet, and powerful. And you've got to practice it. 
So every time you get ready to call that company, you've got to sound like a pro. And I can tell you after 15 years in this business, most of my buzz in the supplier diversity professional community, they can tell you they know exactly who's practiced it and who hasn't. And they will listen to the ones who have got it down to a, an absolute science because they don't have the time to listen to you. Past seven seconds, they're looking at their computer, they're picking up stuff on their desk, and you've lost them. Seven seconds is all you've got. And you've got to be able to answer this question. How are you the only one who does what you do and does it better than everybody else? That's major homework. Because if you can't differentiate yourself from everybody else who does what you do and do it in language that's different from the way everybody talks about your business, you're going to sound like everybody else. And if you sound like everybody else, you are everybody else. And why should I hire you as opposed to the 15,000 other suppliers who are trying to get in my door? And that's how you differentiate yourself. So if I make a follow-up call and I say, hi, this is Mary, please call me back, goodbye, and I can't tell you the thousands of times that CPSDs hear this all the time, why should I call Mary back? There's nothing in that that's a waste of my time. And people get phone calls like that all the time. So let's say I do call you back, and I say to you, what's your company again? Who are you? And you get offended. If you get angry at me, you know, why should I remember who you are? If I've gone to, if, if I'm at WeBank, I've met thousands of people. If I go to NMSDC, I've met thousands of suppliers. How on earth can I possibly remember every single person unless you have dressed up like Big Bird? I mean, come on. If there's got to be a way, either you differentiated yourself in such an extraordinary way or you've treated me with such winning language that you were absolutely memorable. Let me give you an example of that. You've left me a, mem a, 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 a message that said, you know something, Sarah, I know you are so busy. I appreciate what you do for the industry. I know that you'll get back to me when you can. This is what I do. This is the problem that I solve. Take your time. I know you're busy. I really appreciate what you've done. I just get back to me when you can. That's a memorable winning language message. And something tells me she's going to remember who you are. May not remember what you do, and that's what that value proposition is all about. So keep in mind something really important. Supplier diversity is not your only resource. It's one of many, many, many access points into the company. So that's what networking is all about. Supplier diversity is one point of access. Get involved with charities. Get involved. That's what sales is all about. You come in from a thousand different points into a major organization. You get active in the industry. I'm going to give you a list in just a moment of what that's all about. So you think about different ways to get involved and remember that your supplier diversity professional has no contract authority whatsoever. They are a bridge to the buyer. They are dealing with overwhelm from the thousands and thousands of phone calls they get all the time. Their priority is the open RFP that is already there to be filled. They are not interested in one-note wonders, and what I mean by that is somebody who calls up and says, me, 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 I want my contract. The door will slam in your face. If you call up with a service-oriented approach and says, listen, how can I make your job easier? What can I do for you? That attitude will win you a friend immediately. If you call up and say, well, how can I make your job easier? What can I do for you? How can I make this whole process easier? That language makes everything easier. They may not have any time for you. It may not be an opportunity for you. But that immediately makes them more willing for them to give you a referral to another company that may have an opportunity for you. When we call up and demand they get that from everybody. If you pull up with an attitude of gratitude for the opportunity to play at this level, it changes everything. 
What stands out for them is somebody who is willing to be hopeful and grateful and looks for an opportunity to make, uh, make a difference for that company. People are looking for strategic partners. How can I make your company a profit? The next thing I want to do is make sure you understand that multi-tier is how most of us are going to get in the door. So you do your research. I'm going to show you how in just a minute. Find first tier MWBE, veteran, LGBT, disabled, etc. firms. Why? Because a first tier firm that is in our category is required by them to do business with us. So we build partnerships, JVs, and collaborations, and most of us are going to get in at those lower levels anyway, that's where our opportunities lie. And that is where most of us get in the door that's our step in. Over time we grow. The JVs and the collaborations, they are looking at us to do that and to grow and grow and grow and pretty soon maybe we will also be a first tier and creating opportunities for others. Now this is a very serious slide. Because this is why I want us to understand why some of us need to think very carefully about whether or not we even want to do business at the Fortune 500 level. Number one, the margins are a lot slimmer. The Fortune 500 is always looking to cut costs. They are huge, and the reason they are huge is because they're always cutting costs. There's a lot more travel involved. That sounds really sexy unless some of you have small families. And it sounds really great, oh, I'm always at the airport, always at the airport, always at the airport. Or you've got to dedicate somebody to the account. Well, that's money. And then you've got to improve your technology. If you're going to be best in class, you've got to have the best technology. If you're starting to hear the costs involved with, you, with doing this, you're right. It's very expensive. Then we've got this whole idea about credit line demands. And that gets into this whole idea about supplier score. It's called an SER. And if you do not have a good supplier evaluation rating, this is something that Dun & Bradstreet Credibility can help you with. If you have what's called a one, two, three, four rating, which is very, very good, you are much more likely to have an opportunity to do business with a, with a Fortune 500 company. This means that you've got a really good record at doing business with a Fortune 500 company. If you're doing business with these major corporations, but your record falls kind of in that seven, eight, nine category, they say, well, it's just going to take an act of Congress to get you in with the Fortune 500. And this may be because you're not keeping really good records or maybe you're, maybe you're just not doing a really good job, the records are inaccurate. And this is where Dun & Bradstreet Credibility can kind of help you out a little bit. And this is where a phone call would be really in order. And this is where folks like Duskin can, can kind of help you out a little bit. And sometimes it's just we're not – dotting the I's and crossing the T's, and where if you're constantly getting turned down, sometimes we've got to look in our own house and make sure that our record keeping is accurate. So if you're not getting where you need to go, this is where you've got to look at, am I keeping my own house in order? So this is where we've got to look at, do I really want to be at that point where I'm doing business with the big boys because it costs a lot of money to be at this level. And ladies and gentlemen, on this, on this phone call, we've got to look very carefully. Do I want to be a huge enterprise or do I want to make a really, really good le living at that tier two, tier three level and take care of my family? I don't know. That is a question that you must answer and only you can. So this is the slide that I promised. If you want to know who those lower tier level folks are, if you're a startup company, Fortune 500 companies are not going to do business with you. But here's a really good template for how you get started and how you get to be known in your industry. First and foremost, pick a lane. Pick an industry. You've got to be clear on where your playground is. You've got to swim in that lane and stick to it because people want specialists. makes no difference whether you're in oil and gas or insurance or whatever it is, but pick a lane and get to be good at it. Then you join all the associations and the organizations in that industry. Get active, become visible, and at best, become a leader. Pick a topic that you are 
passionate about. Then go to every meeting, every con- conference, every fair. Walk those hallways. Pretty soon you're going to know everybody who's in anybody, and in the next two years you're going to know everybody who's anybody, and you're going to be selling to those people. You embrace an issue and you take a stand. Start a blog, write articles, write a book. You know, do whatever it takes to be known in that industry. You become a consultant over time, and at the same time you're going to be making sales. And so you work your way up to the higher tiers, and I guarantee you somebody at some point down the way is going to tap you on the shoulder and say, excuse me, we've been hearing your name a lot. We'd like to do business with you. Now, is this going to take you a couple of years? You're right. But this is the way to get yourself deeply entrenched in an industry and very well known. And this is the way that you start getting known. And then the follow-up protocols is, ladies and gentlemen, do what they tell you to do. If you get advice from supplier diversity or people in the industry, follow it. And if you, if you get told no, it means no, but you can and should ask why. This is a learning process. Another thing is don't pester, but this varies by person and it varies by industry. So always ask, what does pestering look like to you? Have a sense of humor and be willing to learn. And never, ever, ever call up and say you don't support African Americans, you don't support women, you don't support this and that. People do support. It usually comes down to maybe your credit rating isn't up to par. Maybe it's because there's no fit. Maybe because there's no need. But because you don't want to be blackballed because there's no need for something that you have. It usually is a very good reason. Do your research. Find out what it is. Be humble. Accept the answer and move on. How many companies are in the Fortune 1000? There's plenty of room. And finally, there's time for Q&A. And at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Dustin. I hope this has been useful for you. We've got plenty of time here, I hope. Julie, I know I'm a little bit short on this. I know it's really tight. Sorry. No, it's been most wonderful. I thought your content was really, really top-notch there. And you were, as you kind of promised in the beginning, you flew through, through so much stuff. <laughs> I, I'm sure you could go on for – I'm sure there's, just a, there's a lot more that, that we could go into the details. One of the things that stuck out for me, I was curious, the, uh, you mentioned you've done business with 21 of the Fortune 500 companies. What's the process like for you personally getting, you know, when you're – well, maybe the first contract. How did you go about yourself getting your first contract? With oh, some my. Of these well, you know, the, the, the first contracts came to me because I was doing business directly through WeBank. Number one, I had to get certified. You do not do business without a certification of one kind. I'm a fully disabled Vietnam era vet, but I do not bank on my socioeconomic status. That is meaningless in this business. You have to get certified to get in the door, but your certification does not get you the business. Your ability to add value to the bottom line and number one to the shareholder, and that is the language that you use. If you can add value to the shareholder because your numbers show up in the annual report, your ability to speak that language is what sells you to the supplier diversity professional. So your ability to go to the supplier diversity professional and say, I can solve the problem of bang, 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 that gets their attention. So your ability to speak corporate language to corporate people is what gets their attention. So if you do the business of going to the website, researching the problems, and going to them and being able to say, I solved the problem of unprepared suppliers. Every supplier diversity professional that I spoke to said, I've got that problem, and I got business. So the number one thing I did was I, I identified a problem that my, my client had. That's what got me the contracts. I researched the industry that I chose to help because I've been in sales training for years and years and years. And then I looked for a chink. I looked for a crack because we're the guppies. We suppliers are the guppies that are swimming around the Titanic, and these major corporations are the Titanic, and we need to swim around the hull and say, yo, up there, you've got a crack down here, and you're so big you can't even see it. That's why they want to do business with us, because they're so big, they can't see these little cracks. That's why they want to do business with us. It totally makes sense. So I just posted a link to your book there, which uh, you, was on screen now for others to see. Um, if people are, want to learn more, 
Um, but maybe just briefly tell us for a second about uh, the book. It goes into more details than just after you, know, you meet somebody at an event or a conference. Like, well, what are some of the things they're going to learn if they, if they really want to dive in deep there? Well, Dustin, let me answer that in just a moment because Jennifer has a question here. Um, she asked a question about specific types of companies or industries that appeal more to Fortune 500 companies than others, and what are they usually looking for? And Jennifer, let me respond to that directly. Depends on the industry, and I think one of the things that's really important to understand is there is no specific kind of company. I can I can answer that better by saying what are the crowded commodities and come back around from that way. The number one most crowded commodity is IT and IT staffing. And that is just the number one most crowded commodity. I think what has to happen is that each of us has that, that heavy-duty research to go into our specific industry, what is it that we are very good at, and when we find an industry that we are drawn to, whether it's oil and gas or whether it's uh, retail like Walmart, you have to look at what is it that you are the best at, Jennifer? What is it that you sell? And then you think of, okay, well, I am best suited to work in X. Let's say I'm leadership training or, you know, I make, I make widget or I sell clothing. I've got to pick out where do I fit? Where's my fit? What's the problem that I solve and who needs that, that problem solved? Now, now I've got a lane. I'm going to swim in it. Now I've got to find who buys that and where do I fit? What level do I fit in? And if I'm big enough, if I've got the capacity, and, and Jennifer, capacity is key. Let's say if you want to sell to Walmart, Walmart's going to say, how big are you? And can you deliver semi-load after semi-load after semi-load after semi-load? And you say, well, I can't mortgage my firstborn male child to do that. Well, then I'm going to say, how far down the supply chain can you start? And then you say, well, I can kind of start in Minneapolis. That's as big as I can go. I say, fine. Well, you start with the local stores in Minneapolis, and you build up a record. And when you've got a sales record that's big enough, and you can say, well, you know, I can do, I can do something bigger. Then you've got a sales record that says, well, I can do regional. Then you go bigger than that. Now I can go, I can go several states, and that's how you build up. So the question is, what is it that I do? Where is the best fit? How big is my capacity and who needs what I've got? So this is the research that is incumbent upon us as suppliers. We've got to create the need. We've got to understand the industry, which means we've got to do the down side shoe leather research that says, here's what I've got to offer. Now, this is the basics that gets us in the door. But let's say, for example, you've got something that's brand new. Nobody's ever done this before. Now we've got to actually create the need. Let's say you've got something that's just, you've just patented something. You've got to create a need that nobody's seen before, and this is where you've got to pry a crack into the Titanic. This takes creation. This takes sales. Now you've got to go to the supplier diversity professional and sell them on the ideas. You don't even know you've got this problem. And this is where you've got to go in and create the need. That's a whole different sales process. But that's where you go in and say, based on your undercover boss research, you have got a plant in such and such a location, and they are bleeding money because this is happening, this is happening. I've talked to your managers, and they're losing money right and left here and here. I can reduce your overhead by X thousands of dollars, X millions of dollars, because I can solve this problem here, here, and here. Now you're talking money. And if you're going to do business with the Fortune 500, you must speak metrics. If you don't speak metrics, you're not ready for the Fortune 500. So you've got to create the awareness of your product, create the awareness of your value, because if you do not speak in value add, you look like overhead. So there is no pat answer. Does that help? I hope so. Yeah, no, it's great, great stuff. Um, we also see a, there was a question that came through on Twitter that's not here in the chat, but they had said uh, they were you know, really looking forward to the webinar, and then they, the question they asked was just how do they get the contact information um, for different people? Like, well, is there a place that you would go if you're looking for that kind of information? Oh, boy. You know, I, there, is a, there is a book, and I'm spacing. You know, it, there, is a, there is a list of supplier diversity professionals, and it is available online, and I am drawing, um, I'm drawing a blank, 
and it but is a. We, st- go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, if we find it, let's go ahead. We'll make sure to add it to the. the oh, and I'm so sorry. It's, it's, yeah, it's a it's a major supplier diversity. Uh, it, it, there is there is one online. There is just if you if you were to Google a supplier diversity uh, professional list of supplier diversity, you, you, you probably it would probably come up. It's it's in the community, and you can buy it for about seventy nine or eighty nine dollars. It it is available. Very cool. Other thing I thought I would throw out, I just realized we should give a, a plug for the site. If you actually go to dmb.com slash supplier, you know, there is a page of programs. We actually had one of, uh, some of my team go ahead and find all the links they could to Fortune 500 companies with supplier programs. So we have like 380 links to different programs, whether it be IBM or Heinz or anyone else. Um, we do have links into their programs. It doesn't always have the contact information on those pages, but there's almost always a way to contact the, the organizations, if nothing else, through their websites. So that's another idea Dustin, I'd, I'd throw out there. Yeah, Dustin, let me answer your question, if I may, very quickly on the book. The book, in effect, covers, gives a lot of stories from the field about what to do and what not to do, but in effect, the primary reason for the book is to how to craft a seven-second value proposition, how to create a 15-second verbal capability statement, and a whole lot more. But the essence is how do you present a very swift presentation when you are standing in line at WeBank, at NMSDC, or any of the local events when somebody asks you, what do you do, how do you answer it in less than 20 seconds? Because you don't have 30 seconds to blather. Somebody gives you about seven seconds to say, what do you do, and how do you answer it in such a way that it opens up their pupils and says, I've got that problem. We need to talk. And that's what this book does. I love it. Well, Julia, thank you so much for joining us here. Um, we've used up our time, but I, I can tell you, I know that I'm sure that there's tons more we could dive into and uh, to keep going for a long time here. But really want to thank you. Information was top notch, and I'm sure that the, the people who, are, who joined us, the participants today, as well as many of the other people who will enjoy this for, uh, for the time to come as, we, uh, as, as they, they get access to this stuff on the web, I, I'm sure tons of people are, are thanking you for your time and, and just how helpful you are and genuine. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Well